show you another video example. It's from the uh, TV show, it's a comedy called The Big Bang Theory. The first three years, first two, three years of this show were tremendous. I love them. I continue watching the show, but much like Friends, much like other shows, I don't know what the heck happened to it in the later years. And some of the characters I felt were very harsh and disagreeable, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna talk more about each of those, yeah. Forty, less than 40% of social anxiety disorder will get married. Um, okay, so Big Bang Theory. Yeah, you could just ask me after class, okay? Uh, I'm going to show you this about a four minute scene. This is where, so the, the idea of the Big Bang Theory is there's these three super genius, four super genius scientists who are living together in LA. They kind of live like teenagers. They do a lot of fantasy, nerdy, geeky kinds of things, but their lives are changed when a really fun, attractive girl moves in next door. And I just want to prepare you, there's a joke later on, something you need to know is that uh, Sheldon and Leonard went to a sperm bank to donate sperm earlier in the day. I'm only mentioning it because something comes up later where you'll say, what are they talking about? But I'm just preparing you. It's not a big thing, but I just don't want you to be. I hear an interesting thing about stairs. <laughs> not really. If the height of a single step is off by as little as two millimeters, most people will trip. I don't care. Two millimeters? That doesn't seem right. No, it's true. I did a series of experiments when I was 12. My father broke his clavicle. <laughs> is that why they sent you to boarding school? No, that was a result of my work with lasers. <laughs> New neighbor? Evidently. Significant improvement over the old neighbor. 200-pound transvestite with a skin condition? Yes, she is. Oh, hi. 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 Hi? We don't mean to interrupt. We, we live across the hall. Oh, that's nice. Oh, no, I, we don't live together. I mean, we live together, but in separate... Heterosexual bedrooms. <laughs> oh, okay, well, guess I'm your new neighbor. Penny. Oh, Leonard, Sheldon. Hi. 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 <laughs> well, uh, oh, welcome to the building. Oh, thank you. Maybe we can have coffee sometime. Oh, great. 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 <laughs> well, uh, bye. 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 <laughs> Hi. Again. Hi. 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 Anyway, um, we brought home Indian food. And, um, I know that moving can be stressful. And, and I find that when I'm undergoing stress, that good food and company can have a comforting effect. Also, curry's a natural laxative. And I don't have to tell you that, you know, a clean colon is just one less thing to worry about. <laughs> Leonard, I'm no expert here, but I believe in the context of a luncheon invitation, you might want to skip the reference to bowel movements. Oh, you're inviting me over to eat? Uh, yes. Oh, that's so nice. I'd love to. Great. So, what do you guys do for fun around here? Well, today we tried masturbating for money. <laughs> Wait till you see this. It's fantastic. Unbelievable. See what? It's a Stephen Hawking lecture from MIT in 1974. Now, this isn't a good time. It's before he became a creepy computer boy. <laughs> That's great. You guys have to go. Why? It's just not a good time. Leonard has a lady over. <laughs> yeah, right. Your grandmother back in town? <laughs> no. She's not a lady. She's just a new neighbor. Hang on. There really is a lady here? Uh-huh. And you want us out because you're anticipating coitus? I'm not 
anticipating coitus. So she's available for coitus? Can we please just stop saying coitus? Technically, that would be coitus interruptus. Hey, is there a trick to getting it to switch from tub to shower? Oh, hi, sorry. Hello. Enchanté, mademoiselle. <laughs> Howard Wallowitz, Caltech Department of Applied Physics. You may be familiar with some of my work. It's currently orbiting Jupiter's largest moon, taking high-resolution digital photographs. Penny, I work at the Cheesecake Factory. Come on, I'll show you the trick with the shower. Bon douche. I'm, I'm sorry? It's French for a good shower. It's a sentiment I can express in six languages. Save it for your blog, Howard. So, you guys work with Leonard and Sheldon at the university? Uh, I'm sorry, do you speak English? Oh, he speaks English. He just can't speak to women. Really? Why? He's kind of a nerd. <laughs> Juice box. I don't want to analyze their big five traits. I want to focus in on this distinction. Introversion, shyness, social anxiety disorder, there's four male characters. Uh, there's Raj, Sheldon, Leonard, Howard. Uh, one of them is an introvert who's not shy, who's not socially anxious. Can anyone guess who the introvert is? Yeah. Yeah. So Sheldon, he's not really that interested in people. The other guys think he's a robot because he actually doesn't have kind of a natural understanding of how other people work. And a lot of people think that the character was intended to be on the autism spectrum. And part of the appeal of the show is that Leonard becomes Sheldon's roommate and he tries to help him learn how to interact with others and how to understand others and how to be human. So Sheldon's actually low on extroversion, and he's also low on agreeableness. And a lot of the sweetest parts of the first couple of years is Leonard trying to pull him, pull him gently nudge him to be uh, a little bit uh, better at understanding people. Now, one of the characters is shy. That means anxiety, inhibition, awkwardness. You noticed a lot of awkwardness where they would keep saying, hi, 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 hi. Which character do you think is the shy one? And it's the one who most of us would identify with, yeah. Of, of the four guys. So, yeah, who's the shy one in the group? Yeah, so that's where I was going to go next. So Leonard is shy. I don't think he's socially anxious. Raj goes way beyond shy. He has a social anxiety disorder. In the show, you learn he's diagnosed. He has selective mutism. He cannot speak if he's in the room with a woman. Uh, he... <laughs> In season two or three, he finds that if he drinks alcohol, then he's okay and he can speak to women. The only problem is he becomes disinhibited and then he acts like a brutish, uh, uh, he acts overly confident and he does inappropriate things. He eventually gets help for his social anxiety disorder, medication, therapy, and in the last season, I think he's beyond that. So, but uh, Leonard is the shy one. Uh, he's sociable, he's not introverted, uh, but he's lacking, much like Charlie Brown, the capacity to assert himself and be confident. And uh, 
I think what the show is about, how because of Penny and because of his interest and uh, interest in Penny, he decides he's going to change. He's going to be less shy. He also decides he's going to stop living like a 12-year-old boy and grow up so that he'd have a chance with uh, uh, dating someone, uh, someone like Penny, but just more generally. Now, the third, the final male character, do you think Howard is introverted, shy, or socially anxious? He's, a, he's an off-the-scale extrovert, but you may miss it because he's an off-the-scale neurotic as well. And as I told you before, we often make the mistake of thinking that the big five traits, the positive ends, go together. If you're an extrovert, that means you can't be a neurotic. That's not true. They're totally independent. Extroversion is about positive affect. Neuroticism is about negative affect. And uh, he's a highly neurotic extrovert, and he's an overly confident. Penny, I'm not sure. I think she's more extroverted. Uh, the thing that bothered me about the show is I thought she was really sweet and kind and understanding in the first couple of years. But in the later years, she just becomes a harsh, uh, my sense was she was always diminishing poor Leonard. Uh, and it became like a stereotypical American show where the husband is a, a goofball. Uh, so uh, shyness, social anxiety, and introversion. And um, my sense is that when I was a university student, most of your age, on that scale that goes to 65, I probably would have got a 58 or something. I think by the time I was 24, I was down around 30, 35. And now I'm, well, I think many of us may feel like, okay, we're somewhere on that continuum of shyness. Now, what Susan, uh, what this person, this person wrote about shyness, and he says, he would make the case that shyness, like introversion, should be thought of as a normal behavior, and we shouldn't pathologize it. And he says that our culture expects people to be outgoing and sociable. It's the unstated norm. And against that norm, introverts stand out as seemingly problematic. I can't stand what's going on there in terms of he sh the book's called Shyness. He's talking about introverts. Those are two different things. Again, I want to remind you, introversion just means you're less people-oriented, you like more time on your own, you're, uh, you like quiet places, less stimulation. doesn't imply that you're afraid of evaluation. doesn't imply that you're inhibited in social situations. Shyness is about anxiety and ambition, and I'm guessing that this person is... is confusing those two. Here are the correlates of introversion. And uh, these were taken from uh, Susan Cain's book. And, you know, the, the ones on the left are, I think, ones that, uh, well, talk less when they meet someone new, less eye contact when interacting, less firm handshake. They study in secluded places. They prefer solitary pursuits. They have narrow friendship networks. And they're less likely to emerge as a leader. So if I organized you into study groups, and if I asked you all to pick a leader, the most introverted person would be least likely to be selected as the leader of the group. I think those all make sense. and. But on the other side are some positive things that Susan Cain says are associated with introversion, so that they listen more, uh, they deliberate more, and it helps them make smart decisions. They excel at solitary work, and to become skilled and expert 
in most areas of our lives, it requires deliberate practice where you work on your own, and it's a real advantage. And that's why many studies have shown that introverts actually do better in school. I've told you before that professors tend to be more introverted. In fact, being a professor is the second most popular job for introverts. The only occupation that's more appealing to an introvert is to be a long distance truck driver. Uh, the other thing Susan Cain did in her book, she found one article by a great researcher from Stanford, which actually looked at how introverts do when they're put in a position of managing and leading a group. Uh, and what she found is that introverts can make wonderful leaders, and uh, this is especially true when they have uh, proactive groups uh, which are really eager to, to work on their own and suggest ideas. That was by Adam Grant. It's about 10 years ago, and it was a very exciting finding. I don't think it's been replicated that often. And my guess is that most often being a leader involves emerging as a leader and being recognized as a leader by others, so extroverts probably have the advantage. Yeah. Yeah, you could think about it that way. Uh, it's not measured that way usually. and uh, But I think that's fair to think about a blend. Uh, so I here, let's take Leonard. So uh, Leonard is shy, and he would score shy on that but I don't think he would score high on neuroticism because his neuroticism is really unique to social situations. And, you know, like Charlie Brown, it's really accentuated when there's a girl that he's romantically interested in. So I, I think it can't be reduced that you can't just take someone who's high on neuroticism and low on introversion and say that person is going to be uh, shy. Uh, I'm not saying anything about neuroticism, so I don't want to include neuroticism at all. I could see how you could think of it, but it's just, it's specifying that there's a uh, uh, inhibition and anxiety about social situations. It's very specific. Okay, so what I'll do next is talk about uh, Jerome Kagan, who's often considered like the greatest developmental psychologist, one of the great ones from Harvard. He's a really old man now, he's in his 80s, but he did longitudinal research where he started with kids who were six months old, and he was able to identify something in a six-month-old that would predict whether a child would be shy reactive at 18 months, at four years, at 10 years, at 20 years, and so on. So I'll show you a video about that, and you'll see his paradigm, and I'll give you some statistics about that. It all began 15 years ago when Harvard psychologist Jerome Kagan launched a new study on childhood behavior. When we get started to gather data, like on the tape of four-month-old infants, and over a period of a week, I looked at these tapes very carefully, and to my surprise, I saw these high and low reactive infants. They were just so different. If you've studied infants for as long as I have, then when you see those two types, you know you're seeing something very important. What Kagan discovered was that about 20% of the infants were upset by even the slightest stimulation, while another 20% reacted passively to the same tests. 
Kagan dubbed these children high and low reactive. You have been a very good baby today. For these high reactive children, Kagan's team found that anything new, like the sound of a stranger's voice, upset them dramatically. And Kagan found that these differences in temperament continued as the children grew. For example, this infant, named Blair, who was unafraid of the tests, grew into a curious two-year-old eager to explore this unfamiliar room. Years later, at age four, Blair continued to be unfazed by new situations. Tear up my favorite picture. <laughs> but for Lisa, who cried at the stranger's voice, the story was very different. As a two-year-old, she was frightened by strange places and clung to her mother for security. Over time, Lisa continued to develop into a shy and apprehensive child. Here is our high reactive infant. Uh, here she is at four and a half years of age, and she's asked to make a mark in a book. Notice how quiet, notice how tense she sits. She doesn't look at the examiner. Now she's asked to pour some liquid on the table. She does it, no laughter. This is not a joke. But what role do parents have in shaping how these children develop? Surprisingly, research with monkey families is offering some clues. Taking, um, their location, where they're located physically. Well, monkeys are closely related to humans. They share over 94% of the genes that humans have, and they have the same basic emotions, and more importantly, the same basic underlying physiological processes that sustain and support these emotions. Like human children, some monkeys are born high reactive and are easily frightened by new surroundings. While other infant monkeys are more inquisitive and outgoing. Sumi hopes to understand just how important parenting and environment are to shaping these infants through the years. So he performed an experiment that wouldn't be possible with humans. He switched parents and children. By placing shy infants with outgoing parents and vice versa, he's made an important discovery. What we found is that no matter what an individual's genetic endowment is, how, what kind of behavior its mother shows to her, it can make a big difference in how it will grow up and how it will cope with the day-to-day -day stresses and challenges of the complex social life that's characteristic of these monkeys. So even though genetics can influence an infant's personality at birth, over time, parenting and environment actually play a stronger role. Even infants born fearful can be transformed by nurturing surroundings. And the study of human children is finding the same results. Here's the once shy and fearful Lisa, now age seven. She's not as shy as she was earlier. As a matter of fact, she is overcoming her shyness. See, she talks, she smiles, she talks to her mother. So this is quite a remarkable change. Kagan's quick to stress that in spite of their shyness, these children will lead perfectly normal lives. Green, good, try and shout it out. Brown, great, that's the way I want you to do it. His findings suggest general paths children may follow as their personalities develop. How are you today? Most children will look like average children. It's the extremes. It's going to be hard for a high reactive infant to be David Letterman, very difficult for a low reactive infant to be T.S. Eliot. So uh, Kagan's sense was among six-month-olds, about 20% were very low on this shy reactive indication. 
And uh, the way he measured it was by introducing new events and people. And about 20% uh, didn't show this shy, were really unlikely to show this shy reactive pattern. But he followed them over a number of years. And uh, I'm sorry, I, I misplaced this. Uh, at six months old, it was 20 out of 100 were shy and reactive. But by the age of two, there were only 15 of the original 20 who, who could be identified as shy and reactive. And by age 14, it was only 10. And at the age of 30, only five of the original 20. There were more than 100 participants, but on average. So about 75% of those of us who were born with the shy, reactive temperament seem to shed it by the time we reach adulthood. Now recall that the United States, North America, there's a very strong extroversion ideal. Parents want their children to be outgoing, friendly, exuberant, assertive. A similar kind of study was done in Japan and they found that at age six months, there's also 20% who are shy reactive. But at age 23, 24, there's still 15% who are shy reactive. So that most of those who were shy reactive, they maintain that behavior. So there might be something cultural about an emphasis on shedding shyness. But I'll go back and tell you there's some more interesting things. Uh, okay. In the follow-up studies, they not only measured behavior, but they measured psychophysiology. So for example, heart rate, pupil dilation, cortisol levels, they also eventually did some fMRI studies where you could see which parts of the brain are activated when a novel stimuli is introduced. And the focus is very much on the limbic system, the amygdala, the uh, fight or flight response system. And it seems like the 20% who are shy reactive at six months, the limbic system is triggered. What uh, Kagan was able to show is that even though many of us, by the time we're 15 or 30, are no longer behaving in a shy, anxious manner, if you measure our physiology, our psychophysiology, or if you measure our brain functioning, what you'll see is that we're still reacting as if there was a fearful stimulus at the neurological level, at the psychophysiological level. But we've somehow found a way to override that shy, anxious architecture and behave in a way that's not at all shy and anxious. But the remnants are still visible at a deeper level. Now, uh, Swami talked about, <laughs> I hope they don't do these experiments with monkeys anymore, where you take a monkey and you give it to a different mom. Uh, my guess is that might not be allowed anymore. Uh, but it seemed like, you know, that made a difference. Kagan always felt that uh, parenting could make a difference. And in particular, uh, he talks about gentle nudging. And uh, he had a very shy six-year-old granddaughter. And his own daughter was encouraging her to like be more outgoing and less shy. And the girl really bought into it. And the girl would do things with him like, say, 
make believe I don't know you so that I could have some practice being not shy. And the girl eventually, she was one of the ones who shed her shy behavior. Now, when I'm talking about gentle nudging, uh, you can imagine, and my guess is many of you experience, something very different, which is if you were a shy, reactive child, you probably got told that you shouldn't be like that, and you probably began to feel like there was something wrong with that. So Jay Belsky, who's like a leading parenting expert, he says just about every adult introvert can remember being scolded even if gently for being too quiet. There's nothing wrong with parents nudging their shy children into the world, but there is something wrong if it's more than a nudge. You don't want to break the kid by overwhelming their coping capacity. So the key is sensitive, empathic encouragement. Now, here's another expert who seems to be mixing and confusing introversion and shyness. I think almost everyone would say introversion is just a different st style and parents should be totally accepting of that. Shyness is something else because of the anxiety and inhibition. Uh, I wanted to give you a follow-up about three weeks ago. I did a class about genetics and parenting, and I gave a story about when I was two years old, and I was trying to highlight what an easy temperament I had. And the story I told you was that my mom would put me out in the backyard in a playpen and she could keep me out there for a long time. I would stay in the playpen because I followed orders. My brother would jump out, so she couldn't put him out there. But a turtle came, and I started screaming, the woo-woo, the woo-woo, the woo-woo. And then I told you that my mom came out, she explained what the turtle was, and I was fine, and I could go out there. And it turns out that is all false. I spoke with my mom a couple days later, and she said, why did you tell the students that? that? There's nothing about that that's true, except for the first part. So my mom said that what happened when the turtle came, and I was two years old, was I started screaming and yelling so that the neighbors came over and rang the bell. And I was screaming about the woo-woo, and she had to go down in the basement and come out to the backyard and calm me down. And she didn't explain about turtles. Instead, what happened was I never went out in the backyard again in the playpen. Instead, every afternoon, I would go to the back window, and I would look out, and I would say, the woo-woo's not going to get me. The woo-woo's not going to get me. The woo-woo's not going to get me. And I think that's a pretty good indication that even at the age of two, I had a shy, reactive temperament. So a novel stimuli, other people will react differently. I'm like going ballistic. So I think some of us are wired like that. And it is the case that many of us can overcome it. We can accept this message that we should be more outgoing, more confident, we should go to parties, we should make friends, we should ask people to do things. But what happens if you're one of the 5%, five out of 100, who is still shy, reactive, even when you're 20 years old? And a big problem comes up when you're a 20-year-old, which is you have a lot of goals, developmental goals, life goals. Uh, as a 20-year-old, I wanted to be a clinical psychologist, which would involve talking to people, listening to people. I wanted to do research, which involved going out, talking to people, asking people to do things. I wanted to have a friends. I wanted to have a girlfriend. And if you are a shy, reactive person at age 20, you know, it's, it's hard to know that 
your life will unfold the way you would like it to unfold. So I'll talk some about how, you know, research would suggest we do have some capacity to change, particularly for really important goals. So I'll give you an example. Uh, it wasn't from 20, I was actually 24. I told you the story about the girl, my first girlfriend who thought I was a chameleon, and then she threw the surprise party for me, and then we broke up shortly after. <laughs> about a year later, uh, it was in January, it was a Friday, uh, there was a, a party at the medical school. There used to be these happy hours. They don't do them anymore because there was too much drunk driving. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the psychology graduate students would go over to the medical school because it was mostly for graduate students. And there was going to be a party with medical students and graduate students. And so I went to the party and I talked with some other male graduate students in my program for like 20 minutes. And then I left because that's always what I would do at parties. It's like I could only take so much of it. And then I walked over to McDonald's. I stopped to get a newspaper. I was eating my Big Mac. I was reading the sports pages. And then I said, I can't keep doing this. I have to go back to the party. And I decided my typical way of behaving, you know, I, I couldn't keep doing this, otherwise I'm gonna be a 60-year-old man at McDonald's with my sports pages. So I go back to the party, and as soon as I go back, I see a girl who I'd noticed earlier. Now when I saw her earlier, uh, she was with a group of other girls. And this is a real problem if you're a shy guy. It's like you might be able to go up to talk to an individual lone girl, but a group of girls, there's no way. But she was no longer with her group, and she smiled at me. So I went to talk to her, and it turns out she went to the Newman community where there's like the Catholic church group on campus, and I went there too. And she had just been in Boston, and I had just been in Boston. And she was a nursing student. And my sister actually was a nursing student, too. And two hours later, the, the party closed down. And I had been talking for two hours. And this hadn't happened to me before at any party. So I realized, you know, I should go with the flow. And uh, so I said, uh, you know, this has been great talking to you. Uh, you know, maybe we could go out next weekend. And she said, oh, I have uh, there's some sorority events uh, next weekend. Uh, that's not good. So then I did what I usually do, which is I said, oh, don't worry. That's OK. I'm sure we'll meet again. No big deal. And then she said something that no one had done and no one's done since. <laughs> she said, uh, why don't we go tomorrow? So she was actually suggesting an earlier time to go on a date. And I was really surprised, but I said, sure, that sounds great. And so we set up that we go on a date the next night. But I was really worried because I had talked to her for two hours. And at that point, I still thought I only had about a two-hour capacity for conversation. <laughs> and I didn't know what the heck I would talk about the next day. So, but I decided to act out of character, kind of do the opposite, like George, only not stupid like George. Uh, and the next day, instead of going to a movie or a play, because I'd always break it up so I wouldn't have to talk so much, so there'd be some structure, we, we actually met at mass, the six o'clock mass, then we went for a Chinese dinner, then we went for dessert someplace else, and then we went to one bar and another bar. And in the end, uh, by Valentine's Day, I had a girlfriend. And I had a nice Valentine's for the first time. And my sense of all of that was, 
I pushed myself beyond what I would usually do. And it turns out that's something we can do. So there's a professor from Ottawa University. No, he's from Carleton. He also was a professor at Harvard. You could find he's written a, some books in personality. He has some online talks. His name's Brian Little. And he has this really brilliant idea called free trait theory. We can free ourselves from the constraints of our standing on particular big five traits. And what he says is that the idea, while we have certain fixed bits of personality, we can act out of character in the service of core personal goals. So if I'm a 20-year-old, and if I really want to get my friendship and love life going, it's a really important goal, he would suggest that you can go beyond your usual way of interacting. So he himself, Susan Cain describes Brian Little because he, is, he was nominated as the best teacher in Canada. He's a brilliant lecturer, but he's the sh shyest, most quietest person you'll ever meet outside of the lecture hall. And he explains that he pushes through the constraints of his own temperament because of the value of lecturing and speaking, of truly connecting with students. And it trumps the discomfort of his shyness or his introversion. So he gives examples, and Susan Cain gives examples, of how we can override our temperament because of highly valued, important personal goals. The problem is, it takes a lot of self-control and a lot of energy for a shy person to act not shy. And what he suggests is that we need to recuperate afterward. So a person like me, if I'm going to go to a party, I should plan to read a book or have watch some TV or do something on my own the next morning to recuperate. He says the opposite would work too. If you're a real extrovert and you have to stay in the library all day, you need to plan to do something extroverted afterward. So here are the three different identities uh, Brian Little says we have. Our biogenic identity, which is mostly our big five traits. They're largely inborn and temperamental. Then he says there's a sociogenic identity, which is the personality expected by a culture, family, religion. I haven't said much about that. We will delve into that. But the idiogenic identity is our personal desires and sense of what matters in our life. And the idea here is that the second level of personality, which is about being an agent, which is about pursuing things that are important to you, can actually override the first level of personality. OK. So I gave this lecture about four years ago. And a couple days later, uh, a reporter from a magazine called me and wanted to talk to me about quiet, introversion, and things of this sort. So someone in the class must have known this interviewer. Uh, the magazine is Clindoyle, which I think means wink. I'm guessing it's a ladies' magazine. I don't know anything about it, really. And uh, the lady asked me, actually, we did this all uh, by email, which is the way I do a lot of my interviews. Uh, <laughs> for over a year, there seems to be a comeback of introversion values in a different way. And she asked me, what are the assets of being an introvert? And so I talked about Susan Cain. And I told her I really like the message that it's fine to be an introvert. But there's a more subtle message that I've been trying to get across and that I, I you know, I believe, and it is, 
which is for introversion, extroversion, you can separate it out into social vitality and social assertiveness or social confidence. I don't think it matters whether we're higher or lower in social vitality, although when you're a young adult, you might want to act more like you're high in social vitality. You'll have more opportunities. But I think on the social dominance, social assertiveness, we need a certain threshold level. We don't need to get up to the 75th percentile. But I'm guessing we have to get up to the 10th, 15th, 20th percentile. We have to be able to ask someone who we like and who we want to be friends with whether they would like to do something. We have to be able to ask someone who we're attracted to and indicates they might be attracted to us whether they would like to do something. We have to be able to tell someone who hurts our feelings that they've hurt our feelings. So there's certain basic social capacities we need in order to build a satisfying life once we get to be young adults. And so what I told the interviewer is, yeah, introversion's fine, but we need to be able to be assertive and pursue things that are important to us. There is now research which suggests that many of us would like to change our big five traits. Many of us actually have a goal to be more extroverted. In fact, about 85% of us wish that we could be more extroverted. And they've done studies where they ask people to complete the big five inventory, and for each item they ask, how much do you want to change on this? And it turns out if you follow people over four months, the people who want to change on a trait are somewhat more likely to change compared to people who don't want to change. And if people use some goal setting strategies, like having an implementation plan, then they're even a little bit more likely. So there's now ex evidence that we can decide on our own to try to change our standing on certain traits. Now, I'm focusing on extroversion, introversion, and particularly shyness, but this is true for other things. Some of us want to be more agreeable. All of us will become more agreeable normatively over our lifespan because that just happens. But if we make a specific goal and we want to do that, we can certainly have a better chance of moving along. Uh, here's some examples of small steps and plans people made. Uh, okay, uh, w if you do the shyness scale online, there'll be some online resources. And there's a term that I remember from when I was a kid. You say a person is painfully shy. And what that usually means is that person is noticeably shy. They stand out. They are so inhibited, they are so paralyzed. You feel empathy for them and you worry for them. And uh, here's some things that are associated with painful shyness, like canceling social events, having few friends, uh, excessive computer use, uh, and uh, Unlike what Susan Cain says, unlike what some other people say, I think when we're painfully shy, and I think when we're socially anxious, it's probably a good idea to see if we could do something about it. And what I like to focus on is building our capacity to take actions to pursue things we're interested in. And Brian Little would say that all of us can stretch our extroversion. Now, if this were Valentine's, uh, Valentine's Day is a fun day if you have a partner and you're getting along well. It's kind of a depressing day if someone just broke up with you. It's also a depressing day if you've never had a partner, which was my situation. Uh, 
but uh, one of the things uh, the, the leading expert on interpersonal relationships and dating, this fellow is named Eli Finkel, and he's looked at Match.com, and he got access to all of their data uh, where they try to find an algorithm to predict who to match with who. And they do it based on traits, they do it based on interests, attitudes, values. And I saw something where he decided all of that really doesn't get you too far. And he shifted to doing uh, speed dating studies where university students will meet with 25 prospective dates for two minutes each. And he finds that that is actually the best way to find someone who you will like and who will like you. Because there's some subtle things that happen when you actually interact face to face. You can see if there's a natural synchrony between the way you talk and move. And what Eli Finkel has focused on is something called language style matching. He can identify when a pair are matching their language in a certain way, and he knows that those two are gonna end up liking each other. And he can even predict that they're more likely to be dating. But the thing is, you have to do it with 25 people to find the one or two where you have a match. And if, if I'm a shy, inhibited person who, like Charlie Brown, only once at the end of the year do I get up the courage to go up to the little red-haired girl, I mean, the chances that she'll be the person who I have synchrony with isn't that great. So I think this highlights how important it is to be initiating and active. And in order to do that, I would say we need a little, we, we have to have a threshold level of social assertiveness, social confidence. And the challenge is to find out how to stretch ourselves and take that risk. Uh, I will come back to this in the very last lecture. I'll talk about social anxiety and treatments that are effective with social anxiety. And you could kind of tell I'm obsessed with Charlie Brown and shyness, so I will come back to it, but we're gonna go on to the big three motives next class. And uh, so I'll see you on Thursday. No, I don't know what it is.